So welcome to the second lecture of wireless communication where we'll mainly talk about the wireless channel and the basics of that. Today's topics are to a large extent covered in chapter 2 of the book and I really recommend that you read it. We'll talk a little bit about antennas, pathless and shadowing and multipath and the remainder of this lecture is focused on pathless and shadowing. We will introduce something called free slaw. We will also talk about pathless shadowing and multipath but the main focus will be on pathless and Shadowing, I should be able to describe different path loss models and compute outage probabilities. Now, radio waves are just like any other electromagnetic wave and they're governed by Maxwell's equations, which I give here. But luckily, in communication, we don't explicitly use those equations, but we use so um, basically simplified models. And these models are valid in the far field and they're based on so-called plane waves, which I'll explain in a minute. Now the signal is generated by an antenna. On the left I show here a half-wave linear dipole antenna. And you see that the dimension of this antenna is a half wavelength. So that tells you how big the antenna is. And on the right you see the radiation pattern of this antenna. So this means that um, anybody on the surface will have the same uh, power. And you see that this radiation pattern is curved, but when the receiver, let's say the receiver is located here far away, these curves, they will become less and less, and in the end you end up with basically something that is flat. And this is called the plane wave or far field assumption. And this, this assumption is true when the distance between the transmitter and the receiver is much greater than this equation here, where LA is the largest dimension of the antenna. So in our case, LA would be lambda over 2. The, as you can see also from this picture, the antenna pattern is not, um, not the same in all directions, right? So there's this, let's call this um, x, y, z. So in the x, y plane, you see that you have an omnidirectional profile, but when you go, for instance, in the x, z plane, you see that the antenna profile differs depending on the angle. Okay, so this is, a, this is not an omnidirectional antenna. It is omnidirectional only in this x-y plane. It is maybe also good to spend a few minutes to talk about uh, wavelengths and carrier frequencies. So we will often introduce something called FC, which is called carrier frequency. Right, for instance, carrier frequency could be like 3.4 gigahertz, 30 gigahertz, and so forth. These are typical values for carrier frequencies. Lambda is the wavelength. Okay, and this is expressed in meters. And uh, lambda and FC are related by the following equation. Lambda is equal to, I should double check here, C over FC. Okay, where C is the speed of light. C is 0 0.3 meter per nanosecond. All right, so let's just give an example. When FC is 1 gigahertz, this implies that lambda is equal to 0 0.3 meter. When FC is equal to 10 gigahertz, this implies that lambda, lambda is equal to 0 0.03 meter. When FC is 100 megahertz, although there are no real modern communication systems at such a frequency, lambda would be 3 meter. Right, so if this is a, the figure on the right is a modern communication system, then maybe this dimension would be on the order of 50 centimeters, something like that. Right, so now since we work with this plane wave model, um, which can then be a combination with directional or non-directional transmission, we can work with so-called rays, which we will explain in a bit. So in practice, the communication between a transmitter and a receiver is um, not just pure line of sight, there are also obstacles in this environment. And there are different effects uh, that can occur when the radio wave interacts with an obstacle. Right, so that the figure here shows, for instance, the the wave can go through the obstacle, but maybe it's changing in direction within the obstacle. It can also be reflected of the obstacle, right? So it can generate like a mirror, a strong reflection. It can also be scattered in all directions. 
and there can also be an effect of going around corners, which is known as diffraction. So you have all these four effects here. And um, in particular, scattering and reflection depends on whether the, the object is smooth or rough. So on a rough surface, and here rough means with respect to the wavelength, you will have scattering when the object is smooth with respect to the wavelength, um, you will have reflection. And well, you could, see this is, you could say that this is something bad, but you can also see this as something good because the, you don't need a line of sight between a transmitter and a receiver to have a radio link because the signal can go through objects, can go around objects, is scattered by the environment. So that means you can get some power even when the line of sight is not there. It turns out, but we will only talk about this maybe later in the course, that when the um, carrier frequency goes up, right, then you know that well, the wavelength will go down. This means that the antennas will be smaller because they are typically on the order of half a wavelength. You will also have higher path loss. We'll actually see this in a little bit. And you will also have more optical propagation. Um, and this is because you will not have transmission anymore. You will have very limited diffraction. Scattering will be very weak. So you'll have only few paths and it looks more like, like propagation of light. The picture below also shows again reflection, scattering and diffraction of radio waves. So um, now, now that you know that when a source is generating a signal and you are in far field, you'll have plane waves and these plane waves can interact with the environment through these uh, four phenomena. And based on that, you could do something called ray tracing. So in ray tracing, let me zoom in here. There is a transmitter here in the middle, which radiates power in all direction. And you see when you are close to the um, transmitter, you have high power, but when there's an obstacle, like here, then the signal after the obstacle is weaker. So the signal is weaker here, and this is called a shadow, just like a shadow of light. And then when the obstacle is maybe faced, well, when there's another obstacle in addition to that, and the signal, for instance, here on the top left will become very weak. Now the signal also interacts with these obstacles, so they bounce off like this, and then what this figure actually shows in the end is the received power in all of these locations. So this means the received power here would be high, here would be lower, right? Here will be very low. And you can calculate this uh, based on the so-called ray tracing methods. Now this is still a bit complicated because you need to have a map of the environment and describe what each object is made of. So we work even with more simple models. But let's first see how this ray tracing works for a single path before talking about what happens when we have multiple paths and we don't want to do ray tracing anymore. So when we have a single path, let's say there's a transmitter here, right? There's a receiver somewhere, let's say here. And we want to determine what is the model of the received signal based on the transmitted signal. So this here is the transmitted signal, U of T. This is the transmitted complex baseband signal. This here represents the up conversion to um, passband. And then we have all of this, which represents when, what the receiver sees. And there are a number of effects here. So first of all, there is this uh, GL or squared of GL, which is the directional loss. Because as you know, for instance, for a dipole like this, so I have here X, Y, Z, for a dipole like this, you have this kind of donut shape around it. So that means in these rings in the X, Y plane, you have uniform power, but this power is not um, also towards the Z axis. So, okay, it's a bit hard to draw, but this is what this GL represents. Then you have E to the power minus J two pi D over Lambda. This is just a phase rotation, right? This is because you have a radio wave being sent here and then it propagates over some distance like this. And then this results in some small phase rotation. Well, actually not a small phase rotation, but it results in a phase rotation depending on the distance. So this means when, when the receiver is moving just a little bit, this phase will rotate a lot. Okay. So a way to represent phases, it would be like this. 
this is the real part, imaginary part. When you're at the transmitter, the phase is zero, right? You, there's no phase rotation. When you go a little bit further away, you will have a small phase rotation. And depending on how far you go, this, rotation, this phase rotation will increase and increase. And when you move only half a wavelength, you will have a large rotation. So this is a very rapid change of phase with distance. And then there's the last effect, which is lambda over 4 pi d. And this is called the path loss. So this is the loss of power, the loss of power due to being further away from the transmitter. Now, to, to understand a bit more where does this come from, um, let's see if we can explain this with a picture. Let me try to draw a circle like this. So we're going to have X, Y, Z. Let's see the transmitter is located here. Transmitter. The transmitter radiates with some power, P, right? And then we consider a ball with some radius D around this transmitter. So this is a ball in 3D. Then the power um, that goes through this ball will be P, let's see, over 4 pi D squared, right? So this is the area of this of this ball. So this is the power divided by area. And now we consider a small receiver, let's say here. Okay. And this receiver has a small area A. And then how much power does this receiver capture? The receiver captures this. So this will be the received power is the transmitted power times A over 4 pi. Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, so we have the received power as a function of transmitted power, this, this uh, area of this ball, 4 pi d squared and a. And it turns out, and this is without proof, that a, a normal value for a would be lambda squared over 4 pi. Right, so then if you put this together, it then follows that the received power, this transmitted power, lambda squared over 4 pi d squared times 4 pi so that means is this still visible yeah just pr is pt lambda over 4 pi d squared all right and this is of course in power so in amplitude you just have this effect lambda over 4 pi d okay oof so what we've seen is that there is a distance dependent rotation right there's a distance dependent power decay and the wavelength plays a role as does the transmitter and receive antenna pattern so this is captured through this gl and the, um, this is captured by lambda good now this is also known as the freeze equation okay so which is written here which is basically the same as before, but with small change. So it's the received power at some distance d is the transmitted power times lambda over 4 pi d squared. And then there's these two factors, gtx and grx, and this is the gain of the transmitter and of the receiver along the direction between transmitter and receiver. So to together, this is the same as this gl from before. It turns out that sometimes it's convenient to write this in the uh, db domain so and then everything becomes just a, a sum so the transmit power in dbm transmit and receive gain in db and then you have this uh, this kind of 20 log 10 of the distance so this is how quickly the power goes down with distance good and i think now is a good time to take a break we are in uh, 15 minutes so see you soon So welcome back to the second part of lecture two. Let me start the timer for another 15 minutes. Right, so before we saw uh, ray tracing with a single path, now we will go on to ray tracing with two paths. So the situation becomes a little bit more difficult. So there's a transmitter here on the left side, TX. There's a receiver here on the right side. 
And in addition to the line of sight path, right, there's also a, a surface. So there's some you know, surface that brings a reflection. And there's a lot of geometric parameters here, but I don't want to go through all of them in detail. But you can figure out yourself that you will have a received signal, which will be the superposition of two signals. So there's the line of sight signal, which is this one. It's called the line of sight. And then there's a reflected signal here, reflected from the, oh, reflected from the ground. And what we see if we look a little bit more detailed in the line of sight signal, we have the transmitted signal, we have the rotation, we have the gain in the direction of the line of sight path. Okay, so the gain in the direction of the line of sight. And we have uh, one over the distance between the transmitter and receiver. So this is this distance L between transmitter and receiver. And of course, this is four pi over, uh, well, lambda over four pi as before in the one ray model. Now for the second path, um, we have the signal with some delay, right? Because the, there's a certain delay between the line of sight path and the non-line of sight path. So this delay will be given by, um, let's see, x plus x prime minus L over the speed of light. So that's this delay. That's because the path takes a little bit longer to arrive to the receiver. You have, again, a phase rotation, which depends on the total path length. You have the channel gain along the reflected path. So this, this is determined by this value and this value. And then you have R, which tells you how much power is reflected. So R will be something uh, between 0 and 1, how much power is reflected by the surface. And then you have this uh, 1 over distance. So now the distance is the total distance um, along the path. Okay, so we see that each path has its own rotation, which depends on the length of the path, and each path has its own gain, which depends on the distance, and it also depends on the antenna pattern in the two directions. And again, recall for this this, uh, this uh, single antenna dipole, so in the this XY plane, you have omnidirectional transmission, but along this orthogonal plane, you'll have some radiation pattern that looks like this. Okay, so depending which direction you look at, these gains will be different. Now, with this model, we can compute the power. We can evaluate this received power. And this is what's shown here. So in this figure, we have on the x-axis the distance in the logarithmic domain. The y-axis the received power in dB. And the, the, the path loss equation from before for the single path, I'm just going to draw a sketch. Let's see. It's probably not very accurate, but maybe something like this. This would be the Ron Ray model, right? And this is because... We have this equation here, the received power is some value and then minus 20 log d. So it will be just a line here. But for the two-ray model, things become much more complicated, right? So you see that the power goes up and down. You have all these zeros, this lot, lot of fluctuation. And then at some point, it kind of settles down and it just decays. And the reason for all these fluctuations here is that you have these, uh, these complex numbers, these two complex numbers for each path that you add up. And you can have constructive or destructive interference between those paths. And together they will decide this pattern of, of, of up and down of this power. So you, you see that even for the, the two path model already the math gets a little bit annoying. So that's why, in general, we don't do this for many paths. So if I go back a few slides. So what this figure showed was somehow the received power using ray tracing with many, many paths. And you, this is basically a computation that you need to do. But it doesn't provide much insight. So rather than doing that, we work instead with statistical models that try to represent how a typical environment looks like without needing to simulate all of its fine details. And this is called uh, the simplified model that we will use throughout this course. In the simplified model, there are three effects. There's path loss, which we've seen. There's shadowing that we'll see later. And then there's multipath. And each of these uh, occurs at different uh, length scale. So the uh, figure here shows as a function of distance, the received power divided by transmitted power. 
And here you see those three effects. So there's the, the path loss, which is this line. So this is the deterministic decay of power with distance. And then there are large scale fluctuations around this line. And this is known as shadowing. And this is due to large obstacles. Oh, what did I write now? Obstacle, obstacles. And then finally, the last effect is, is these very small scale fluctuations here, which happen at very small length scales. And this is due to the constructive and destructive destructive interference of paths. And each of these paths, of course, is a complex number. So this means that when the receiver is moving further and further away in this direction, overall the power will go down, but there are large fluctuations around this, uh, this path loss. And in addition to these large fluctuations, there are also lots of smaller fluctuations uh, due to multipath. And multipath is basically caused by these other effects, reflection, scattering, and diffraction in the environment. So if we accept such a model, that means that we can uh, just focus on the models for each of these three components, path loss, shadowing, and multipath fading. And um, these first two effects we will talk about today or in this lecture. And this uh, large, uh, the, sorry, this multipath fading will be in the next two lectures. And we can write these effects all, of course, in the dB domain as a receive power being the transmitted power plus path loss. So this will be a negative value. Shadowing, this can be positive or negative. Okay, let me write this positive or negative. A multipath, which can also be positive or negative. Good. The model for path loss, um, well, we've seen already the freeze equation, so which is actually um, shown here. Okay, so this is also a model for path loss, if you want. But what people have done is also done experimental campaigns and then based on data that they collect, they will determine other path loss models. So for instance here, this is a model where you show receive power as a function of a distance in the logarithmic domain. And then based on lots of measurement, there's all these data points, you try to find the best possible line that explains this measurement and this will be a multi-slope path loss model. And of course, this depends on the environment where you've done the measurements. If you do the measurements somewhere else, the path loss model will be different. In most of this course, we will actually use a much more simple model, which is this one, which is the single slope loss, where the received power is a transmit power times a constant, and then times basically d0 over d uh, to the power gamma. In here, this gamma is known as the path loss exponent. Right, and um, gamma is equal to two for the freeze equation. But according to measurements, it can be larger or smaller than two. D zero is a so-called reference distance, typically one meter. Oh, yeah, yeah. I should really work on my handwriting. Reference distance. K, this represents the gain of the receiver and gain of the transmitter in the direction of transmission. PT is the transmit power and PR is the receive power. And then you can write this in the DB domain as follows. Okay, so it's really similar to what we had before, but somehow a bit more general because gamma doesn't need to be equal to two. Based on measurements, the value of gamma can be um, can have a different range. It can be even less than two, but it can also be much greater than two. 
Right, so this means in this so-called urban macro cell where the power decays really, really quickly with distance. And here in this factory, apparently, maybe there was some waveguiding effect and the power decays very slowly with distance. So let's now do an, an example together. Suppose that you're given these measurements um, on this table here in the bottom, showing for different distances the ratio of received and transmitted power. And um, I also tell you that the carrier frequency is 900 megahertz. The reference distance is one meter. The value of K is given by this in the dB domain. And I want to, you to find the path loss exponent that explains these measurements. Right? And the way that we will do this is by solving a least squares problem. So we will try to find a line. Okay, so there's a, a line here shown, shown in green. These data points are the blue uh, stars. This represents these data points on the left. We want to find the line that somehow best explains these, me these measurements. Okay. So to do this, we will use the least squares framework. And while I'm sure you've all seen least squares before in, in other courses, it's good to just briefly recap this uh, for this course. So suppose that you're given um, observations. Let's call them yi, i from 1 to m. And you have a model where yi is, let's call it, a times xi plus ni, where ni is noise. And your goal is to find a. And here also um, the xi's are known. Find A. Now to do this, there are many ways that you can do this. You could do something called maximum likelihood, which we've seen actually in the first lecture. But here we will use least squares. sometimes abbreviated as ls, and we will set up an objective function. So we'll find a, a cost as a function of a, which is given by sum i from 1 to capital M. Um, well, if things are complex, I will write like this, yi minus axi squared. This is the least squares function. Okay, and as a function of a, I don't know how it looks like, but maybe it looks like this. So this is the cost as a function of A. And I want to find the minimum. Okay, this is the my guess, A star. How do I find this? I take the derivative of the cost with respect to A and set it to zero. And that gives me an equation as a function of A. And then I find the optimal value of A from that. If um, the least square function, now here the least square function is linear in, in A, or at least this part here is linear in A. If it's not linear in A, then you, you will need to do some uh, something more sophisticated where you'd have to try different initial guesses to find the best A. All right, now with this in mind, uh, you can try to solve the problem. So I recommend that you pause your video, go back to this problem and solve the least squares function. I see also our 15 minutes are up, so then I see you at the next part of this lecture. Good, I hope you had a chance to try to find a solution to the problem. So recall that the least squares cost as a function of the unknown a was given by sum i from 1 to m yi minus a, no, not a, I, a x i squared. So in our case, the yi's are the received powers. Right? These are the measurements. These are given in this expression here. And then the aixi is actually given by, by this equation here. Okay. And in here, so let me just, these are the measurements, the pr over pt measurements.
k we can compute because we have all the information, right? So k is given by 20 log 10. This is equals lambda over 4 pi. And after some math, you find this is approximately minus 31.5 dB. Um, these are also given. These are the distances. Right, so then what you have is, is basically of, of the form here on the right. Okay, so there's something known, which, well, let me try to highlight everything that's known. This is known, and this is known, and then you just have this one unknown thing, which is this gamma. Okay, so it turns out in this case that if you expand this cost function f of gamma, you find that it's a second degree polynomial here. And then you take derivative with respect to gamma, set it to zero, you will find that there's two solutions and the only plausible one is this one. So this gives you gamma is equal to 3.75. And from this you can predict what will be the received power at any other distance. So in addition to shadowing, there are two other effects, multipath and, oh sorry, in addition to path loss, there's two other effects, uh, shadowing and multipath. So Let's now go into shadowing. So shadowing is the effect of the, the decay of the received power due to large objects in the environment. But again, this is complex to model because then we should try to figure out where are all the objects, what kind of properties do they have. So again, we use a, a simpler model. And based on experimental data, it turns out that the large scale variation of the received power around the path loss has a so-called log normal distribution. What does this mean? This means that when, let's say, okay, let's first see what is a log normal distribution. This means that when a random variable that I convert in the dB domain, so here phi should be greater than zero, I convert to the dB domain, this has a Gaussian distribution. And then we call this variable psi to have a log normal distribution. Okay, so psi is log normal when 10 log 10 of psi is normal or Gaussian. And it has a certain mean and a certain variance. And this mean here would be the received power due to path loss. So this is the path loss as a function of the distance. So if I try to draw a picture of this. We have here log of distance over the reference distance, receive power over transmit power in dB. Then we have the path loss equation, something like this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sorry. And then we have our data points clustered around this curve, right? So it turns out now when I remove this, um, I wipe off this line, then and after wiping off this line, I will get something that's zero mean. If I remove this line, and again, I have log d over d zero. And if I make a histogram of all of these in the db domain, I will find something that is approximately Gaussian. Again, everything here is in the, in the db domain. So if I have a Gaussian in the db domain, I go back to the linear domain, I have a so-called log normal distribution where it's important to know that the variable has to be greater or equal than zero. Well, strictly greater than zero actually in order to take the logarithm. Um, there are also models for the correlation of the shadowing over space. This is known as the Goodmanson's model. And this correlation over space depends on the distance between two locations. And this, this correlation is given by this uh, correlation function here, which depends on the distance between two locations. And what this equation tells you is that when you have two nearby locations, their path loss will be uh, correlated. So they're not independent. No, sorry, their shadowing will be correlated, not the path loss. Just as an example of the log normal distribution, um, the figure in the bottom is in so-called linear scale, the figure in the top is in uh, db scale. 
if you assume that the receive power at 100 meters due to path loss is minus 110 dBm, so that means due to path loss only, you have this received power here, and you have shadowing with a standard deviation of 3.65 dB, then it would look something like this. Right, so the received power at 100 meters will have this distribution in the dB domain. So it fluctuates between, let's say, minus 120 to plus to minus 100 dBm. And then to go, if you go back to linear scale, you find this. So your um, minus 110 dBm, I guess, will end up somewhere here. And then you have the variation of the received power in this as this log normal distribution. And note that the scale here is very small. That's another reason why we use dB for um, expressing things. Excuse me. Good. Now, given um, the same data points from before, you can try to find out what is the shadowing variance. Again, you can take a small break. Then we come back to the solution. All right, and now the shadowing variance will just be whatever remains that is not explained by the path loss. So this is, uh, this is what is this equation is giving. So I, I remove, actually this is gamma star, which is the, the value that I found before. So I take my measurements, I remove the path loss. So mi is the measurements. This here is the path loss. I remove the path loss. Then I just have something that's around zero. And then I take the variance of whatever I have left. That turns out to be 13. And based on this, I can find the shadowing standard deviation as 3.65 dB. Now, since um, path loss is deterministic, but shadowing is random, we can, uh, with shadowing, at least associate something called outage probability. Outage probability means that the link cannot be established. So it's outage is something bad. And it's defined as follows. So outage probability is the probability that the received power is, be, is, well, actually it should be below some threshold, then you are in outage. So this should be below. And the threshold here could be something related to the receiver, the minimum value that you can reasonably detect. So let's suppose that you only have path loss and we define outage probability as the probability that the receive power is less than some threshold value, P min. Now, you know that when you have um, only path loss as a function of D, you compute the receive power, it will be something that decays with distance, right? And I can also, in this figure, plot p min here. And then there will be some value d max. And if you're further away than d max, your power is less than p min, so then you're in outage. If you're uh, less than d max, your power is large enough and you're not in outage. So based on this, you can compute the outage probability. Right, so there's this value d max where the received power is equal to exactly p min. If you're further away than d max, you're in outage. Closer, you're not in outage. Okay. And then again, this picture on the left shows this. Close from the base station or the transmitter, you are not in outage. You're happy. Further away, you're on in outage. You don't have a link. So for path loss, this is rather straightforward. For shadowing, it's a bit more involved, but not very hard. So again, outage at a certain um, location x. So again, we have some position x, which is at a distance d away from the transmitter. Outage probability is a probability to receive power is less than some uh, threshold value. I can, of course, convert everything to the db domain. Nothing changes. But now I have an expression for the receive power as a function of distance. Right? This is the path loss equation. It's transmit power, this k constant, and then minus um, this path loss part, plus the shadowing. So this here is the shadowing, which has a distribution that is Gaussian, zero mean here, because the mean is already captured by the path loss components on the left, 
and some variance sigma squared db. And in all of the things on the left side, the only thing that's random is the shadowing. Everything else is deterministic, so there's nothing random about that. And now, well, and I, I let this as to, for you as an exercise. Um, you can then say this is equal to the probability that psi db is less or equal than some value. Uh, let me call it a, right, where a is p min, and then I subtract everything related to the path loss. And now this is of the same form as the problem of probability over random variable less than some threshold value y, where x is a Gaussian with some mean and some variance. And the way that you solve this problem is with a Q function, right? X minus mu minus Y probably. I, I, I'm not going to go into more detail, but you can solve it like this. Maybe there's one minus, but it, it, it uh, involves a Q function. And then um, you can also plot this outage probability as a function of distance, and it will look something like the figure here on the left. So when you're very close to the transmitter, you have low outage probability, but not exactly zero. And as you move further and further away, your outage probability will tend to 1, but never exactly reach 1. All right, so now we've seen two effects of the channel, the path loss and shadowing. In the next two lectures, we will talk about the third part, which is the multipath fading. Now, in order to get a little bit of intuition before we start, I have made uh, this one additional slide. So here I have on the left side a transmitter here, let's say, a receiver there. And let's suppose that the transmitter sends a pulse, which is very narrow over time. Then the receiver will see this kind of signal here. Okay, so it will see the transmitted pulse with many replicas because it passes through this environment. And each of these replicas probably corresponds to a bounce of a wall and it could be first and second degree bounce. But now let's suppose that instead of sending this narrow pulse, the receiver is sending a very uh, wide pulse, very long pulse in the time domain. That means all of these multipath components, they will all merge together, right? So they will, they, will look like some, they will look like a single pulse. And this is called the narrow band regime. And now what happens, suppose that I, I move the receiver a little bit, you know, just half a wavelength, in the wideband case, the signal will stay more or less the same. All of these paths will move a little bit, but things will remain more or less the same. In the narrowband regime, what can happen is that all of a sudden the power becomes like this. So you, you receive almost nothing. And if I move a little bit further, then the, the amplitude can, can be like this. If I move a little bit further, amplitude can be like this. So there's large fluctuations of the received power in this narrowband regime. And then the two slides on the bottom show this kind of similar thing. So let's suppose the user is moving and then over time, you will see that the power fluctuates a lot due to this addition and uh, constructive and destructive interference of the multipath. And the figure here shows exactly the same thing as a function of time, depending on um, how quickly the user is moving, you have more or less fluctuations. Of course, if the user is static, static user, as a function of time, in principle, the power should be constant. Right? If everything is frozen, nothing will change over time. But in practice, of course, uh, even if the user is static, the, there could be small changes in the environment. Could, even the leaves of a tree that are moving, uh, you could have large fluctuations of this received power. All right, so this will end um, the second lecture where we've seen the a free space path loss, defined by Free's law, which you, which, you, which you should be able to state and interpret. You should be able to, to say what is the difference between path loss shadowing and multipath fading, describe different path loss models, and also compute outage probabilities due to shadowing and path loss. So then, see you later for the third lecture.